Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and once again, we're here with the podcast, and this will be um, episode number 41, actually. Uh, it was kind of cool that we hit 40 with our big guest last month. Um, once again, we've got another awesome guest for you this month, um, Ra Russ Burke, a doctor um, in the biology department at Hofstra University, will be joining us tonight to talk uh, Diamondback Terrapins, as well as other neat research he's got going on. And there might even be ways you can get involved in a little bit of what Russ has happening. So um, as always with me uh, on the is Anthony and Kevin. And uh, thanks for joining us tonight, Russ. We're really glad to have you. Oh, this is really exciting. And, um, and I've been working with you guys for a while. It's good to see you in another venue. It's our Indeed. pleasure for sure. Absolutely. Definitely. Absolutely. So uh, one of the reasons we wanted to have Russ on um, is number one, because he's a tremendous guy and we thought that uh, he'd be a lot of fun for people to kind of uh, be able to get to know a little bit here um, tonight. And, and also just the, the absolute um, um, magnitude of these amazing projects that he has going on that, that do involve, some community um, people as well, but then also can bring in other folks. Uh, we've been collaborating with him on an exciting project. I think we should probably start with that one. Um, sure. it's, it's something sure. that I've really uh, I've been enjoying. And, um, you know, you, people probably look at us funny when we meet in parking lots around the <laughs> Northeast. <laughs> and trade little boxes. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck is in that box? It seems valuable. What are these guys doing? Yeah. So, so we've been uh, providing some hatchling turtles and soon uh, some tortoises as well to a study that, that you're doing at Hofstra. Now, I know, and I know you said it was cool to talk about it, but I also want to say, you know, I know that sometimes uh, the science community, you don't like to talk about it until the paper's published. So, you know, maybe you don't have to tell us everything. You know what to say. But, yeah, but I, I want to be mindful, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So... Um, and I, and I, you know, I'm so grateful for, you know, the cooperation from, you know, like Anthony and Steve, you guys have been fantastic. And, um, you know, as you know, I'm in some ways, I'm a fairly traditional academic biologist, you know, I'm used to working with, you know, my study organisms, all that kind of stuff. And, and I do a lot of conservation work, but I've always had, you know, a, 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 a pretty heavy involvement with the, uh, the folks that breed stuff on their own, the, you know, the, 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 the folks that, um, you know, who don't come from traditional academic backgrounds. Um, you know, I spent a couple years working at a zoo when I was uh, in, uh, in high school, actually. I've worked in the pet trade for a long time, and I've always had at least, you know, one, one toe or two or three toes uh, connected up with the pet trade folks. And, and, and then, of course, in more modern times, so many pet trade folks have, have, have moved into, into conservation that, you know, even those boundaries have blurred a lot. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm all for it. And, you know, anybody who's on the same side I am, I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm totally with them. And um, so that meant that when I started a project where all of a sudden I needed access to a bunch of hatchling turtles of different species, you know, the traditional way we do that is we go, okay, so where can I go in the wild where I could catch those animals and bring them into captivity and do this? And for the kind of project that we're doing here, that would be absurd. I mean, I wouldn't be able to do this because it would be overwhelming to try to get these species from the wild. So the logical thing to do is to talk to the people who are breeding them right now, who has to have young right now. And, um, you know, you guys have been absolutely invaluable in getting this project off the ground. When I told my graduate student, okay, we need six more species and we want as much diversity, phylogenetic diversity as we can come up with, let me call some friends. Uh, you know, they're going, you're nuts. You know, this will never happen. How could you ever get this off the ground? And, um, you know, you guys stepped up and um, we've been doing great. And and with this bat, you know, these little tortoises that we're going to borrow from you next week, um, actually this week, uh, this week, you know, uh, you know, this this will this will be the completion of the project. So that's so cool. I can certainly tell you about it. Um, so. Um, we, you know, partially it's, it's kind of a weird way the science project came around because we had access to this equipment and then thought about cool things we could do with it. And that's not usually the way we do things around here, but sometimes we do. <laughs> so we got access to this equipment that allows us to measure metabolic rates. And so, you know, we can tell basically how much oxygen animals are consuming. And we started using it for one project, but then we realized, oh, there's a whole other cool thing we could do and it dovetailed with another set of projects we were doing. And basically what we're looking at is, 
ways that we can test how physiology matches with behavior. And so we've been doing work for a couple of years on how things like freeze tolerance and desiccation resistance, you know, how well animals can avoid drying out when they're in dry environments, how those match up with what hatchling turtles do after they emerge from the nest. So, you know, some turtles, they come out of the eggs and they sit in the nest all winter long. And some turtles come out of the nest, out of the eggs, and they emerge right away, and they walk down to the water, and they sit in water for the winter. Mm -hmm. And some turtles come out of the nest, and they come out of the egg, they come out of the nest, and they go to uh, someplace else on land, and they just hang out on land and wait for, uh, wait till the winter's over. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a whole variety of different behaviors they do. And each of those means they live in a different microhabitat, and we would expect their physiology to match that. So that, that's kind of cool even to see that. But the cool step beyond that is that there's a bunch of turtles where we don't know what they do after mm -hmm. they hatch out. And if we've already established a pattern for other species, then we can go to species where we don't know what they do and say, okay, based on their physiology, we guess they probably do this. And so we've been doing both of those things, both matching physiology with behavior in species we know and then projecting for species we don't know. And right. so that's been cool. We've been doing that for a couple of years now. We've got a paper coming out in, uh, in a journal uh, later this year, early next year, that so will summarize all that stuff. So then we got the metabolic equipment, and we thought, oh, this will be a whole other phase of that same thing. The animals that sit in their nest all winter long, we expect them to have low metabolic rates because all they want to do is, ki is kick back and wait until it warms up again. And the ones that, that uh, come out and use water and walk down the water, that's one thing, right? So they're going to go down to water, and then they're going to get cold, and they're going to chill. And other animals, they got to walk and find a place on land and then dig down into the ground again, and then they're going to chill. So different physiologies in every case. And then we got tortoises, which I expect are going to be up, and then just stay up because they live in a warm place. So right. we've been measuring metabolic rates all the way along, but we're targeting species that do very different things after they come out of the egg and out of the nest. And... You know, we need a wide diversity of animals. That's where we go to you guys. That's wonderful. Now, do, how many species have you tested so far? And we how are, many do you think you need? We've got several from you. And all told, we've got, I think, your tortoises will make number 12. Wonderful. So, you know, stuff like in my dids, we're pretty well covered because we have those things in my lab anyway. You know, we've got terrapins, we've got box turtles, we've got painted turtles, we've got map turtles. You know, all the common stuff that we have around here anyway that we work on normally, no problem. Those are easy to do. I haven't bugged you for those except for the Emmys. Right. Uh, but, you know, stuff like the roots, I mean, you know, where am I going to get, you know, we don't, I don't have geomitids uh, sitting around my lab all the time. And tortoises, I don't normally have those on hand. So um, this project actually and the equipment came to us pretty late in the nesting season. Mm -hmm. So I know that if I'd come to you guys two months earlier, I'd have gotten right. a whole nother, you know, a whole, had access to a whole nother batch of tortoises, uh, turtles. But, um, you know, kind of it came, the idea to do this came to us kind of late in the season. So you guys were especially important uh, for that reason. I think it's really interesting when you mentioned how some, some species, we don't know what they do after they hatch. That's right. I, I see this all the time um, where – when folks are talking about how you should take care of an animal, they talk about the importance of UVB for hatchling animals and lighting. So many animals, really, once they hatch, they're they're hiding out. You're not seeing them basking like you would see maybe a neonate painted turtle or something like that. They're they're kind of going down in the muck and they're down in the darkness and they're looking for invertebrates or whatever they can find and they're not really doing much. That's and, right. And yeah, so things like security and humidity are so much more important than lighting. But I think it's interesting to see how that comes out in your study as well. Very cool. Yeah, our lab is really focused a lot on, um, on hatchling turtles, partially because so little is known about what yes. they do in the wild. I mean, they're just really hard to study. And uh, our, we really got started in this uh, working on box turtles. And, you know, box turtles are amazing because, you know, there's so, been so many research projects done on box turtles, and yet there's, like, critical parts of their life history we know almost nothing about. If you dig through the literature, you know, there's a couple of scattered little papers here and there that talk about what hatchlings do that give us some hints. But, you know, one hatchling here and two hatchlings here and three hatchlings here, that doesn't really tell us very much. We need 30 and 40 and 50 and 60 to start to see what patterns look like. 
So we did a, one of my early master students did a project with hatchling box turtles uh, 10, 12 years ago. And that got me excited of, oh man, we could do this now. The technology is available now to do this. And then with our Terrapin project, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, we have access to lots and lots and lots of hatchlings there out in the wild. So we were been able to really tease apart the the you know the the common behaviors and then the rarer behaviors that hatchling terrapins do. And that's just gotten me more excited about working with hatchlings. Uh, and uh, and so branching out into a wider diversity of species has been even more fun. That's so cool. I mean, this is something that I'm very very interested in. And you and I hadn't even really talked about like this before. So that's so cool. It's it's. It's, it's a pleasure. I, I talk about it all the time and um, I harp on it all the time. I see people, like I said, with the information and, and scientific research is lacking. With I, I've, Some animals that come to mind are, are Blanding's turtles, are oh, definitely yeah. one, uh, Western pond turtles. They're just, all the research is on adults. So, you know, there's, there's just nothing on, on younger turtles and what they're doing. That's so cool. Blanding's turtles are a great example. Now, because, although this isn't our work, but this is very similar related work that another lab did, long before anybody tracked any Blanding's turtles, there's a lab that looked at freeze tolerance and desiccation tolerance in hatchling Blanding's turtles. And they found out that they are moderately freeze tolerant and they're moderately desiccation tolerant, which suggests that they don't go to the water because if they go to water, then there'd be no need for them to be desiccation tolerant. So it suggested that they were kind of intermediate between Mm. overwintering in water and overwintering on land. And now the little bit of data, data that we've got from people tracking hatchlings is that they go to moist places on yep. land. So yep. it's perfectly predicted where, you know, the kind of habitat they use. And, you know, wood turtles, it's starting to look like they're aquatic, but there's still some aspects of, of wood turtle hatchling uh, ecology that suggests that they may they also may spend a fair amount of time on land as hatchlings, maybe even overwintering again in those kind of moist but terrestrial environments. It's the jury's still a little bit out on that. We need more tracking information from wild wood turtles. Wow, that's so cool. Wow. And we, then we start getting into non-American turtles. Right. I mean, there's all the stuff to be done on non-American turtles. Right, of course, of course. Yeah. We we do some work in Pennsylvania with with wood turtles, and I've I've um, uh, done some tracking. In New York as well with wood turtles, and, and it's it's finding a hatchling is like winning the lottery or getting struck. Oh yeah, lottery. It's, it's so it's, much fun. Yeah, we we've been work, we've got a wood turtle project in northern New Jersey. We've been doing for uh, twenty years now, and you know we have a lot of data on sub adults, but and 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 adults, and we watch nesting and all that kind of stuff. And you know we watch a lot of hatchlings go out into the uh, out into the world, and we see very very few of them later as adults. But we do have several that we've seen from egg to adulthood now. That's wonderful. Yeah. So, do you think that this project, uh, and can I say Miranda? Is that okay? Miranda, yeah, absolutely, sure. So, so I should give Miranda a shout out. She's working on this project. She's the grad student that's working on this project um, with the metabolic rates in these hatchling turtles and tortoises, which is just so cool. Um, it, is this something that you're looking to carry on to next year, or something that you're looking to finish up right now? Well, it's a, that's a great question. You know, we started this kind of as a let's see what happens if you know, type thing. And um, a lot of it depends on the data, how the actual results come out. We haven't completed any of the data analysis yet. So so I'm really excited about that part of it. I kind of like doing it blind, you know, mm -hmm. making predictions about what we're going to find. And, and the data analysis isn't done yet. So I don't even know yet whether the patterns will match what we expect. Um, but um, I definitely think that, um, you know, given that we've got the equipment, we've got trained people who can do it. Um, if the patterns look interesting, like if we can make some sense of what's coming out there, I would definitely like to do some other cool turtles. Like uh, Steve and I have talked about Kohila, you know, Terrapin Kohila would be mm -hmm. very cool to look at because, you know, their, their terrestrial origins, their aquatic behavior, we know nothing about what hatchlings do. Mm -hmm. uh, they would be, you know, and we've also done box, you know, Eastern box turtles, so we've done a close relative. It would be super cool to add some cool species like that mm -hmm. to it. I'd also very much like to do uh, Russian tortoises, uh, horsefeld eye, because um, they overwinter many, you know, depending on which ones you're talking about, overwinter in cold environments. So they're one of the few tortoises that does this in cold environments. So it would be, you know, it would be very cool to look at them as well. So there are some species I would very much like to add to this collection. Mm -hmm. we have, we're not going to do this year for sure. And I'd love to do next year. So we may very well be doing this again.
Wonderful. Well, I'm happy to hear from from a selfish standpoint because I think that we'd be able to really provide a lot of animals um, since you'd already be started once sure. things start hatching, including including aquatic box turtles, terrapin, cohila. I have. If you're interested, because you're you're coming this week, so <laughs> have I have some here. I don't. I don't have. I don't think I have enough though. I only have three. Ah, uh, <laughs> that's all right. We're not going to do. We're we we've, we've had to call a stop. You know, we can't keep doing this forever. We have to stop with <laughs> with, with, a, with a, a batch and and write up what we've got. Uh, right. But uh, but we definitely uh, we definitely uh, will be looking at doing this next year. A lot of it depends on Miranda's plans and. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you know she's applying for PhD programs right now, so uh, a lot of it depends on how busy she is next year. That's so great, really, really cool. Um, so you mentioned the the, the Diamondback Terrapin project, and and yeah. um, I wanted to segue there. Um, I think this is such a great thing. Uh, that's how I first heard about you. Um, just kind of as a fan of all things turtle related, um, you kind of take notice of important things that are happening um, in the turtle world, especially things that are relatively close. And me being in Connecticut, um, I was excited to, to hear about what was going on and actually wanted to try to get down there to volunteer at one point, but was never able to do it. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that project? I find it fascinating that, that that's happening right there, kind of in the middle of everything. Let's see how much time we got, Anthony, because I, yeah. I spent about three days talking about this project. <laughs> That's terrific. <laughs> you want to warn me carefully about how, you know, you want to be careful about how much you ask me here. Yeah, we this can is only, a, We can only give you about a day and a half, Rob. Oh, all right. Then I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, this is this is one of those little tiny things, you know, you know, I, you can point out in your life that started off really small and you had no idea where it was going to go at all and just kind of ballooned into an all-consuming thing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we've been working on uh, diamondback terrapin ecology at uh, Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge in, in New York City um, for uh, next year will be year 20. So uh, we've been doing this a long time now. And um, it's amazing because 20 years in, I still still feel like there's just we know nothing, you know. Uh, so, you know, we've we've published, um, oh, I forget the count, 12, 14, 16 papers on the subject. We've had, uh, uh, I don't know how many uh, master's students and undergraduate students do projects with, uh, with, with uh, Terrapins. And, you know, we've just, we've done so much, but I still feel like we're, we're just scratching the surface. But, you know, let's, let's talk some more solids here. Um, so we've been mostly doing nesting ecology, which means, you know, the turtles come up on land and uh, we collect data on the females themselves on the nests that they lay, on the hatchlings that emerge from those nests. Um, uh, we, collect, uh, we, we collect data on the diet of those females because we, we, we take some of those females, we hold on to them and we soak them in water for a couple of days till they, they defecate and then we see what they've been eating. We collect data on, uh, you know, we mark every one of those females. So we, uh, we know if this is a female we've seen before pretty much now uh, you know, we collect, we, we will capture about 300 to 400 females every year, and almost every single one of those is marked. Um, almost every one of them is a girl that we've caught before. And there are girls that we've been catching just about every year for 20 years now. So we have repeat data on their nesting behavior, on their nests, the egg size, the clutch size, nest success, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff for lots and lots of years. We know a gigantic amount now about what determines whether a nest is going to be successful or whether it's going to be unsuccessful. Um, yeah, it just goes on and on and on, guys. Uh, you know, we've been, you know, we've we've done this a long time. Um, we've um, we every year we do a basic set of data data collection that's the same every year. You know, female size, uh, uh, clutch size, all that kind of stuff. But then every year we've got a whole new set of projects that we're we're adding to what we've done before. Um, every year I've got um, uh, I've, every year I've got new students who are working on the project. This is almost entirely a volunteer-based project, which is what Anthony's talking about here. Um, so every year we get 20, 30, 40, 50, some years as many as 60 volunteers who come sometime during the nesting season and help out. Um, yeah, a lot of them come from New York City, but we get people from Jersey. We get people from from Connecticut who drive down, and you know they spend a day a week or you know a couple of days for you know and that you know whatever. 
it's just a great project. I mean, uh, we, uh, you know, we do, we think of it as citizen science because um, we take a lot of people who never, you know, aren't really like traditional scientists in the, nor in the normal sense. And, you know, they're contributing data that is invaluable. Um, we played, a, you know, as a result of the work that we've done, we've played a major role in getting the, uh, the state regulations changed mm. and getting the requirements about, um, about uh, harvest and uh, about exclusions and, and crab traps changed. Um, we've, uh, yeah, I mean, where do you want me to go from there? I mean, there's just, we got two <laughs> days, three days, and we can keep on going, man. It's great. Um, you know, this all came about because a graduate student, one of my, my actually my very first graduate student, uh, when he and I were deciding on what project he was going to work on, I wanted him to work on spotted turtles up in northern New Jersey. And he was a New York City kid and said, I don't want to do that. That's too far away. I want to work on something close. And he said, I know this place where there's terrapins. And I said, I don't want to work on terrapins. I don't know anything about terrapins. Mm. I'm not really that interested in terrapins. Let's work on spotted turtles. And he said, no, I want to work on terrapins. He was so right, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really easy to get to. The site, you know, you can get there by subway. You can get there by city bus. Wow. Uh, and uh, it's easy to drive to. And even from Hofstra, it's about a half hour drive. So, you know, it, and from our study site, you know, where we watch Terrapin's Nest, you know, Manhattan's in the background. The Empire State Building, you know, uh, is right there in the background. And we watch Terrapin's Nest, you know, with, with the city in the background. Uh, so, That's uh, unbelievable. Yeah, so. it's, it's amazing. And, and, you know, anybody who's interested in watching, uh, come on down. Uh, we'll, we'll put you to work, I promise. That was my uh, next question is, is how can somebody get involved and, and there, is there any prerequisite? Is it okay? Is it okay that I'm a, 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 a felon? Is it okay that I, um, well, that in, I your got case, in your case, <laughs> it does matter. Uh. <laughs> I'm not a felon and nothing against anyone who does have a felony. I was <laughs> saying, yeah. I'm we sorry. live in a world where you need to point that out. Um, yeah. I'm just saying, just <laughs> hypothetically. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, really, uh, we, uh, if you go to our website, which is jbtr.org, probably we'll post this at the end, jbtr.org, you can see that we've got a little section in there on volunteering. You can see video about what volunteering is like. You can see, you know, it, basic requirements. But it's, it's really simple. I mean, it, we want people, we prefer people who can make a regular commitment, like can come once a week or something like that, or a longer period at one time. But even so, you know, it's a, the park is open to the public. Anybody can come there. And mm. if you come there in June and July and, uh, you know, during the nesting season, during a good nesting day, you're going to see Terrapin's Nest. I mean, it's it's just the happening. Um, there are days when we when we get 30 or 40 or 50 nests in a day. Mm. Um, one of the cool things about Terrapin's, which I didn't know back then when I told my grad student I didn't want to work on Terrapin's. One of the cool things about Terrapin's is that a full nesting event from the time they start scratching the surface till the dime they're patting it down, 20, 30 minutes. Wow. Not, not two hours, not Good three speed. hours. Yeah, they're done in half an hour, uh, yeah. almost, and sometimes 20 minutes. Uh, so not like, not like most turtles where, you know, where it's three hours or whatever. These guys are nesting in the daytime uh, and they are done in no time at all, which is why we can do so many nests in a day. Because, you know, not only are we all sometimes watching three turtles nesting at the same time, but boom, 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 they're done. And we're on to the next turtles. Mm. Uh, they are remarkable. Um, they've got these really big back feet, you know, that really yeah. can scoop up a lot of sand at a time. And they're, you know, they're grabbing the sand and plopping it out. And they could dig a hole and be down to egg depth in five minutes, seven wow. minutes. Yeah, they're just, amazing. boom, they're done. So, um you know, I, I cut my teeth on gopher tortoises, you know, and they reach their foot down into the bottom and come back up with like three grains of sand. <laughs> and then they go back down and there's another three grains of sand. And then a big time, they might get five grains of sand, right? <laughs> and tortoises, it's a teaspoon every time. Boom, teaspoon, boom, teaspoon, you know. Mm. And, uh, you know, they've practically got hands to grab the sand, you know, uh, with their big with their big webbed feet. And it's all soft sand. So um, they're remarkably fast. Um, they're so fast that if you turn away, like if you're occupied, you're trying to watch one turtle behind you and one in front of you, you could miss the one behind you. 
They can wow. get done and, and walk away and you never see it if you're not paying close attention. When I wow, when I was work, watching Wood Turtle's Nest, you know, I read War and Peace. I read Crime and Punishment. <laughs> I did stuff like that. With therapists, you don't read a book. You know, you don't you don't check your messages because you're gonna miss them if you do that. They are that fast. Now are you head starting uh, hatchlings as part of we, that project? We do a little, we do nest protection a lot. In other words, we put protectors on nests a lot. Uh, and, um, uh, and so that we mostly do that so that we can get data on the hatchlings. So, you know, if we want to know what percentages of the eggs hatch or, you know, what's average hatchling size or when do they emerge or any of those kinds of things, we, you know, we got to protect the nests because if we don't protect the nests, 95 or hundred percent of them get hit by raccoons. So we know from you know lots of years of doing this, raccoons will get almost every nest. So if we want to do any work with hatchlings at all, we got to protect them. So we do that routinely. And so some years we have 100 or 150 nests protected. Uh, and then um, you know when the hatchlings emerge, we will um, open up those protectors and get the data we need from the hatchlings and then let them go. Uh, sometimes that means taking them down to the water. Sometimes that means letting them go at the nest site. Uh, different things, different years. Wow. Very cool. Yeah, we have a lot of... Russ, I have a couple questions for you. Yeah, go for it, man. Sorry. So with the females that you're collecting, you know, just to check them out, how are you marking them? We do two things. Uh, we give every girl a notch, but uh, they're not unique notches. So, they're, you know, that doesn't tell us who they are. They just tell us, us right off the bat, you pick up a girl, we know we've caught her before. The second thing we do is every girl gets a pit tag, uh, gets a microchip. And um, so uh, we've got uh, something in the order of 3,000 microchips floating around Jamaica Bay right now inside of turtles. Uh, okay, awesome. Microchips are fantastic. I mean, you guys probably use microchips all the time. Um, we use them. Uh, they're permanent. They're relatively inexpensive. Um, they're absolutely unambiguous. You know, I scan a microchip on a turtle. I know who that girl is. Uh, and so, you know, we've got microchips that we put in 15 years ago. And, you know, of course, they're perfectly fine right now. So um, we're ramping up right now to um, start working on the males, which means we're out in the water trapping uh, turtles, which we've just started doing the last couple of years. So I need another four or 5,000 microchips. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we microchip everybody. Okay. You say awesome. four or 5,000 microchips is... is do you, how many females do you have microchipped? Can I ask that? Several three, probably three thousand, maybe thirty-two hundred right now. Oh no wonder you need volunteers. That's unbelievable. <laughs> well, microchipping is easy. That's easy to do. It's the cost of doing that. But even right. though that, that's not too bad. You know, we we're able to raise a little money here and there, and that pays for all that stuff. Right. But yeah, that's a, a lot of work either way. I mean, a few moments. Actually, putting them in is easy. Uh, right. It's uh, yeah, you know, you got to buy those. Right. And the readers are a big part of this too. You know, the microchips, I, I buy a thousand microchips at a time, but, but the readers are, you know, they're $800. $800 and, uh, you know, if I've got several teams out there working on Terrapins, every team's got to have a reader. Right. That adds up quick. Right. You said you had a couple of questions. Yep. Yes, I, I do. Um, the second question was, how often, if ever, do you have, you have you found people trying to poach these animals now? I know New York just recently passed the, uh, uh, I don't know if it's called legislation or whatnot, to yeah. stop the, you know, collection of it. So are you seeing people actually in your sites trying to take these animals for their own gain? Never. It has never happened in all the years we've been at Jamaica Bay. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't happen in New York, um, but I think that the people who, who um, you know, are trapping them and, and selling for food, that kind of stuff, I think it's probably pretty limited in New York. Uh, the illegal part of it, you know, the people who do it without permits. Uh, yeah. I think it's probably pretty rare. So think about it this way. You know, we put cages over these nests, and um, anybody who goes out to the park, if they ask what those cages are, they get told, you know, uh, yeah. those are those are on terrapin nests. And, and, um, and they're perfectly open to the public. Anybody can see those. We've never had people mess with them. It just doesn't happen. Now, those are hatchlings, and if people wanted – adults for like food or, or export or something like that, they might trap the adults. But um, we've never seen any evidence in Jamaica Bay that that's happening. Now, I, I think that, uh, you know, probably most of the market for New York Terrapins has been satisfied by people who got licenses to do that, you know, to go out and trap. 
Now that stopped. Right. That's no longer legal, and so that won't happen anymore. So if it happens anymore at all, it'll be illegal. But okay, yeah. uh, we have seen very little evidence that there's trapping going on in, uh, in New York. Um, I suspect it's been pretty minimal. Um, even New Jersey, it's been pretty low scale, uh, you know, that we actually know people are taking turtles from the wild. And I would say that it's for a couple of reasons. One is the people who breed terrapins for pets, they want prettier turtles than they're going to get out of the wild. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, you can buy really, really lovely terrapins from, you know, captive born animals that are way prettier than 99% of what I pull out of the water. You know, I got to say it. I mean, our terrapins are gorgeous, but they just don't hold a candle to some of the ones I see for sale in the pet trade. And if uh, personally, the wild caught stuff that I see, you know, out there, I I love the giant megacephalic heads. Oh yeah, and the way they look, you know, and you don't get that. And uh, but I'm talking about northern. By no means am I suggesting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about, really see it. Yeah, I'm talking about New York and New Jersey animals. You know, mm -hmm. but you're right. There, there are other parts of the range where that might be different. But here in the north, you know, uh, our turtles are gorgeous. I mean, I love every, I would never criticize the appearance of any of our girls. They are gorgeous. <laughs> but, you know, when you compare them to some of the cool stuff that people have in captivity, you know, no, no scars, no damage, you know, they've been kept clean their whole lives, all that kind of stuff. You know, they're pretty spectacular. Um, I don't keep any terrapins in captivity because, you know, I spend my life around terrapins. But, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the ones I've seen for sale in the trade are just spectacular. Uh, uh, we get, we do get occasional animals in the wild that are really, really super pretty, but you know that's not. They're pretty rare. You know, that might be one out of fifty. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we don't see much evidence of people taking them for the trade or or for food. That's really good. I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. 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 Uh, I do. I do have one more question. It's not so much a question as is uh, just something for you to maybe talk about. Sure. Uh, about a year ago, I had emailed you about what I live in Connecticut, also near Anthony, um, about what I can do here. And yeah. you had sent me an article saying to track mud snails as opposed yeah. to actually trying to find the terrapins. And I thought that was, I've never even considered that before. You know, I thought that was really cool. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I have an, another grad student who's following up on that stuff right now. And um, I think this is, you know, it, it just, again, just took me off at a completely different angle than anything I'd ever done before. But we, we came across this paper that was published uh, several years ago where um, a researcher found that um, there's a parasite that only lives in its adult stage. It only lives in terrapins, but in its intermediate stage, it lives in mud snails. And terrapins get infected because they eat the mud snails, and then the parasite matures inside uh, the terrapins, and that's what reproduces. And what they found, uh, not only is this cool life cycle, but that if you go to an area where which has terrapins and mud snails, and you don't know how big the terrapin population is, it could be huge, it could be thousands of individuals, it could be 10. But if you go to the mud snails and look at the mud snails, you can easily tell if they're carrying the parasite, and you can easily tell whether they're carrying a lot of the parasite or just a small number. And if they're carrying a large number of those parasites, that tells you that there's a, uh, a large terrapin population in the area. And if you only see a few of the parasites, that tells you there's a small terrapin population. And they did enough work to show that the number of, uh, 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 mud, of parasites on the mud snails is a pretty accurate predictor of the size of the local terrapin population. So to me, what this says is, uh, uh, that we can easily look at the mud snails, we can easily count the parasites, and therefore count how many terrapins are in an area without having to trap a bunch of terrapins, go out there in the, I mean, much as I love doing all that stuff, but really easily and readily counting the number of terrapins. And so, uh, so what I thought was, look, if we set up a bunch of people doing that at different places, we could tell whether terrapin populations not only are big or small right now, but whether they're decreasing or increasing in size if we did this every year for a bunch of years. Mm. So uh, that's that's a citizen science project that we're working on right now. We're trying to perfect the technique so it's really easy for people to get accurate counts and tying it to a bunch of, 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 of populations of terrapins. And then we're going to put out a whole, a whole a video and a whole bunch of instructions so that we're hoping middle school kids and high school kids that are going out to the beach with their classes 
you know, they look at horseshoe crabs and all the other cool stuff they do. They'll do this too. And then if they do this every year, you know, two years, three years, four years in a row, we'll be able to tell whether their local terrapin populations are increasing or decreasing. And, you know, they'll be able to actually do some really good science and they'll be able to compare their results this year with previous years, with their this year with what other populations up and down the coast are doing. We'll be able to get statewide estimates of population trends with an hour's worth of time. Yeah, that's that's so awesome. And then yeah. you're, you're, you're researching a protected species here without ever having to touch it. That's right. And so that means you get a, away from all a whole bunch of the problems of, of, you know, getting permits and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, make it really, really easy. Plus, you know, every kid needs more experience dealing with data and collecting numbers and plotting trends and do, all that could be built right into it really, really easily. So right now we're, 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 we're fine tuning the technique so that we can put it out there to the general public. But uh, we've already been trying it out with middle school and high school classes. And um, I can tell you sixth graders are great at this. Uh, they are so good at seeing the, the, the little little cysts on the snails, way better than I am. Uh, but uh, uh, it's <laughs> outstanding. Fresh eyes. So, oh yeah, you know, and, and once you train a sixth grader, it takes about 10 minutes, they're, they're just fantastic at it. Um, and so we want to do workshops with the teachers up and down the East Coast and then have them take their classes out when they go out, you know, and, and collect the data. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, we want to have a website where all these data will be plotted so they can easily compare their results this year with previous years and, um, you know, post their own pictures of what they're seeing. And, you know, they'll be able to write reports, short-term and long-term reports, and, you know, regional and, and, and whole full coast, the whole thing. That's so terrific. So yeah. we should be up and running next year. Well, you can count me in if at least coming down for one day just to check everything out next summer. Absolutely. Um, so so yeah. what I'm thinking is we're going to do workshops. We're going to go to each state and do workshops and uh, train a bunch of people, and then people we train can train other people. We want to train so the trainers. If you want to come to Connecticut, I know where there's a healthy population. Uh, Excellent. So Solely based off of the amount of predated nests that I find. Within a quarter mile, I find 40 predated nests. All right. Well, we've already so. shown – we've already uh, we've been through uh, the Long Island Sound part of Connecticut and shown that okay. parasites exist all the way through that area. Uh, so we know okay. that we've gone up to Massachusetts, and they go all the way along the southern coast of Cape Cod, but they stop right there. They don't go around the coast of Cape Cod, so they're around the east end of Cape Cod. And then they go all the way down the east coast to northern Florida. So that whole – that's – that's uh, just about half of the terrapin range, so we could we could set up censuses for people to do half of the terrapin range. Now, have you not seen anything in the Panhandle over into the Gulf Coast, or they yeah. just haven't been checked? This mud snail actually doesn't go around the uh, around into the Gulf. It stops at about okay. Jacksonville. So um, there may be something else that picks up at that point, but we haven't we haven't been down there to check it out yet. That's so interesting. Okay. Wow. That's right about the end of the uh, the range, right up at Cape Cod for for the diamond. That's right. That's, That's right. We go almost yeah. to the range, the northern end of the range. Uh, yeah. I mean, mud snail technique should work almost to the northern end of the range, um, and then, um, but not as far south and across, you know, to the Gulf Coast as we'd like. Right. Right. That's so interesting. That's so cool. Who's who figured this out with the mud snails? Um, it's a paper by Byers. Um, I think from North Carolina several years ago. I can certainly send you the citation. Uh, okay. And then um, we've done one paper already um, building on that. And right now, as I said, we're working on um, on the next stage of that process. Yeah. We're trying to make it available to the public, you know, make it more available to the public. So what I sent you was kind of beta testing. We're, we're in gamma and delta by now. <laughs> okay. Very cool. And Kevin, yeah. you said you were going to go down for a day next year. He already said he doesn't want anybody just to come down for a day, man. Nah, yeah, nah, I just, nah. it's for me. It's just it's all I got. You know, I got to just go check it out. You got to do it. Absolutely, come on down. Tell you what. So what you guys got to do is you email me and and what your availability is going to be like, and I'll look at your days and pick out a good day for this likely to have a lot of nesting. Would okay. it be okay? Would you be okay with us taking video footage there? Absolutely, we do it all the time. If you look okay. at our website, you'll see there's video there already, and you know, of course, video is great. Um, yeah, we, we like to step in and make it look like we're we're involved, even though we're not. You know, uh, don't make it, man. You'll do it for real. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> take, take, some credit for your, take some credit in one day for your 20 years of work. Yeah, like, absolutely. Like you you. Yeah, it'll be that terrific. doesn't come for free. Uh, you're, you will definitely pay for that. <laughs> 
we've awesome. actually talked about this project in one of our uh, World Terminal News videos. Oh, remember, Anthony. Awesome. Yes, I absolutely do. Yep, yep, yeah. I do. And, and that's, like I said, that was the project that kind of opened my eyes to Professor Burke and, and all the amazing uh, the things that he's doing. And then I noticed, oh, wow, he's talking at the New York Turtle and Tortoise Society. And, oh, wow, he's going to the Galapagos Islands and, and so many other cool things that you're involved in. And that's what we want to talk about next. Do you have anything else on Diamondbacks, Kevin, before we... No, no, I talked about what I the questions I had. Thank you. Okay. Is there anything that you want to add, Professor Burke, about about? Uh... Well, again, how many days you got? I'm reading. <laughs> I just want to make sure there wasn't anything pertinent that you really wanted to get out right now. We'll make sure to plug everybody at the end. Um, jbtr.org is the website. I've already attached a link to the YouTube. Page. Oh, thank you, guys. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. Um, that's the website where you can see uh, what's what's been going on. Uh, with this amazing 20-year project and also see the videos that, that we were talking about. Um, that's just the best. And and so I already... Know, we plotted out the next 20 years of projects. <clears throat> I mean, we, I yeah. the, the, the end is nowhere near. It's like, uh, the only question is how we're all going to be able to make it last another, you know, how we're going to be around for another 20 years to do it because we've got so many more projects to do, uh, so many interesting things to do yet. That's so cool. Oh, such a fan. But you want to I, talk about the Galapagos. I do. I, I, that was that was the next. I was going to ask you uh, when when are you leaving? This is very soon, right? Well, okay. So I leave for the next trip on the third of January. So in 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 about a month. Um, but um, this will be. Uh, I think this is trip number ten uh, for me. Um, so uh, you know, I think probably like a lot of you guys, you know, I grew up dreaming someday I'll get to go to the Galapagos and, and hang out with the real tortoises, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. none of this fooling around with these tortoises you could pick up in your hands, but, <laughs> but what the real tortoises. And um, soon after I started here in my position at Hofstra, um, we started doing um, uh, study abroad courses where we were able to take students uh, overseas and uh, we set up to do, uh, to go to the Galapagos. And uh, so uh, we brought, uh, I teamed up with a, with a friend of mine who's a geologist here at Hofstra, uh, Brett Bennington. And um, so we kind of team up biology and geology and we go down together with a group of students, uh, mostly undergraduates, but some graduate students as well. And uh, we've gone mostly in January, but a few times in July as well. And uh, uh, we, uh, we linked up with a really good company down there that's been, um, been wonderful to us. And, and really the special things that they do is they, um, they treat us like a university uh, class, you know, the, a biology and geology class. And by that, what I mean is we're not tourists in the sense that we come there knowing nothing about what we're looking at. You know, these right. are people that already have some background. And so what that means is... Um, they don't treat us like raw beginners. Um, right, right. They assume that you know, that, you know, that you know, everybody has some background and knows what they're talking about. And so, um, uh, uh, so our, our, you know, we we ended up with a, a, a after a couple of trips, we ended up with one of their most excellent guides down there, and um, it's because of him that we continued to want to do this. So I'll just give you an example. Um, like the the first trip, we we went with him. We come around, you know, some bend on one of the islands on the trail, bend on the trail, and there's a Galapagos hawk sitting right there on a, on, a, on, a, on a bush. And these are like wicked cool hawks. I mean, they've got the most amazing mating systems. It's un, practically unpress, unknown elsewhere in the bird, bird world. Amazing animals. And I see this hawk, and, you know, I know what it is. I've, I've seen pictures of them like we all have, you know. And, you know, I launch into the stupid professor thing about what Galapagos hawks are all about and how cool they are. And, Amazing, and the hawk just stands there looking at us while we're doing this, you know, and waiting for me to get done. And I get done in five minutes or whatever, and and the <laughs> students are all jotting down notes like they're supposed to, right? That's what. And then when I get done, and our guide says, uh, waits a respectful pause, and he said, "Are you done?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." And he said, "Okay." And then he tells us about the work that he helped researchers do last month on Galapagos hawks that is not in the published literature yet, that nobody else knows, but they hired him for, you know, three weeks to work, help them find Galapagos hawks and do this work. And he brings us up to speed, you know, and all my, everything I know about them is two years out of date because I'm yeah. reading stuff that's been published. And he's there telling us, okay, and here's the icing on that cake that makes that all work. Mm. And so, yeah. you know, so, you know, this is, this is what we get when we go. So, um, 
uh, you know, the Galapagos has just been you know, phenomenal, and we've had such a great time every time we go. And um, uh, so what that meant is that in the last several years, I've started taking tourist groups in the off years. In other words, in the, every, we take the class down every other year, and in the alternate years, I've been taking groups of biologists, uh, I'm sorry, groups of people who are really interested in turtles. Because the students are great, you know, Hofstra students are great, but they're not really like turtle people, you know, for the most part, you know. They, they want to hear, see all the other stuff too, and that's great, but, you know, they don't want to hear me drone on for an hour about Galapagos tortoises every day. You know, that's a little much for them. And after they've seen two or three Galapagos tortoise species, that's enough for them. But mm -hmm. I want to see every one, you know, I want to see all of them. And so I started making trips that were focused specifically on turtle people, you know, people that would be happy to spend a half a day helping out at one of the conservation centers, oh. uh, 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 working on improving the watering system that isn't working in one of the tortoise pens or <coughs> something like that. And uh, so we've done that twice now, and I'm starting to plan for the next one. And uh, that's been a lot of fun, too. Um, so I've been able to take some some turtle biologists, you know, friends of mine, people I've known for a bunch of years, um, who never would have done a Galapagos trip because, you know, they don't want to be lumped in with all the tourists. They mm. want to spend more time really seeing turtle stuff, and you're never going to get that. You know, that's just never going to happen. But we've been able to do that the last couple times. I don't want to sound like an advertisement, but I will say that for me personally, it has been outstanding fun. You know, it... Uh, I, we get to spend a lot of time looking at the tortoises and the turtles there. And, uh, and you know, we talk turtle for a couple of weeks, you know. And in the next trip that we do, we're going to add an Amazon leg to it. And um, we're targeting matas. I want to catch mata matas in the field. And uh, I think we've got a pretty decent chance of doing that. So that's, uh, that's the next trip. Oh. I want a picture of me holding a big mata mata. You no, know, that's that's the goal. They get large. They, get, they large. get large. You've seen all those pictures of people holding alligator snappers and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm topping that man. I'm doing I'm doing a model. I, I, you know, we see put so cool. Uniphilus down there all the time. Really common. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we see dwarf caimans. The last time we were there, we saw a jaguar. Uh, we, you know, we've seen lots of really cool stuff down there. But <laughs> I want to see models. Um, Russ, I figured being in New York, you'd see plenty of jags on the road. Well, uh, it's not my neighborhood, man. <laughs> not where I hang out. That's the east end of the island, not my neighborhood. That's so great. <laughs> no, it's funny. I, I think one of the biggest stressors on my marriage, and th that sounds really deep, <laughs> but listen, is is the is what my wife likes, to, what she sees as a vacation, and what I see as a vacation. She yeah. wants to go to to you know a, an island in the caribbean and and sit there and get weighted on the entire time and just sit in the sun and do nothing and i'm like antsy i like yeah. i want to do something. i want to like what 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 species of slider lives here and how can i find it like you know and then and then i think the idea of what you said like working on the watering system like is there anything cooler than that that's how i would want to spend my vacation you know I, I would i would shovel tortoise poop if i needed to but I, I just think that's so cool to actually spend time at a place like that see how it operates and I take that over a Coco Loco any day. <laughs> That's well, really I'm cool. hardly the one to teach you about the lessons of a happy marriage, but uh, <laughs> uh, but you know we do. A, my wife and I we do a fair amount of trading. <laughs> right. <laughs> one right. time, one thing; one time, another. So. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the Galapagos is a great place to go hang. I mean, it's it's uh, it's very relaxed, and you can chill and and. Um, you know, we've had people that came along with this trip that are that are not really very physically able, and so when we're doing particularly challenging things, uh, they, uh, uh, you know, they can sit that one out. Mm -hmm. So on this on this next trip that I'm planning for January 2018, um, right now we're looking to um, uh, do a couple day boat trip up the west side of Isabella, so we can get into habitat where we can find saddlebacks in the wild which is uh, generally pretty hard to do because they live in pretty remote places that are pretty, um, pretty um, uh, challenging areas to walk in. Um, so I'm expecting right now that the people who aren't up for the, uh, the physical aspects of that, they'll stay on the boat and uh, they'll watch, uh, uh, they'll see whales, uh, you know, they'll see sea lions, they'll see flightless cormorants, 
while the rest of us go climb a volcano and uh, come back down the next day and camp out on the volcano. So they'll get catered to by the folks on the boat, you know, food and snorkeling and all that kind of stuff. And the rest of us will be sweating it out on the side of the volcano. So, um, you know, they'll feel good. We'll yeah. feel good. You know, I'm, I'm a happy guy. That's awesome. Well, <laughs> I'd much rather take the ladder. Like, are there, are there bad mosquitoes? That's got to be, right? No, uh, Galapagos actually is pretty good with mosquitoes. Uh, uh, in the cities, and of course there are cities in the Galapagos, uh, there are mosquitoes. But once you get out of the cities, there's none at all. It's a desert. You know, most of it's desert. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there's no mosquitoes. Um, and the mosquitoes on Long Island are way worse than the mosquitoes in Galapagos. <laughs> Uh, is there anything nasty that you're dealing with out there that, that comes to mind that kind of makes it unpleasant or besides maybe the heat? The Galapagos is very benign. It's not hot. It's not cold. Even though it's on the equator, the water's fairly cool. So it keeps everything relatively cool there. Um, it's like a, it's like normal spring on Long Island. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, 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 there's not, the insects aren't bad. The heat's not bad. You know, it's a wonderful place. Of course, we're there mostly in January, which is a great time to be there. Um, even in the rainforest where we go, um, mosquitoes are much worse on Long Island than they are in the rainforest. Wow, that's so, so interesting. It's, it's pretty mellow. Um, it's, uh, it's warm and it's humid in the rainforest, but the bugs aren't bad at all. I get more mosquito bites on a typical day in the field on Long Island than I do in the rainforest. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's really nice. Fascinating. Ecuador is a great place to visit. It's, it's you know, they, uh, they use our currency. They use our elect the electricity is the same. And uh, they speak Spanish very slowly. So uh, oh, you know, nice. how, much, how much more can you ask for? <laughs> <laughs> that's terrific. Makes yeah. it easier to translate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Is, is, is this a... a, a trip that um you actively look for people to kind of join up or is that something that you usually have uh when you do the trip for for more of the turtle enthusiasts as opposed to the the class i'll um, be putting a call out um probably just as soon as i get back from this trip but i've already been talking to people about you know i've already been spreading the word like there's a turtle and tortoise society like you mentioned earlier already been spreading the word that i'll be that i'll be doing this um so we can we can take um uh, 14 or 15 people total. Uh, that's a full boat. That's a full trip. And um, uh, I know that some of the people who have gone on previous trips are planning to come on this next one um, because we'll be doing different things in part. And because um, I think for a lot of people, one time is not enough. Uh, and they want to do it again. I certainly want to do it again. Pringles, uh, but can't stop. What's yeah. that? Pringles, once you pop, you just can't stop. That's just like that. Exactly. And, uh, uh, but there's, you know, there's going to be, I still, certainly I'm going to be looking for more people to join us uh, because, uh, you know, I, I certainly, you know, I want to have a full group and, uh, you know, it, it, we're, we're going to be doing different things than we've ever done before because we can, and some new things have opened up. Some parts of the islands have opened up that weren't open before. So uh, mm. yeah, I'm really, I'm, I'm definitely going to be looking for people to join us. I wish. Now you, you said- as a teacher, that's a tough time. Sorry, you, you said 14 or 15. That would mean if I decide to go, then we'll only bring 14 because I'll take up two spots on the boat. <laughs> only two? Right? <laughs> weight, weight, has, weight has to matter, right? Doesn't it? Um, you know, it's funny. They only care about the weight of your luggage, uh, not about the weight of the person. Oh, good. I won't. I won't bring anything. I just bring one pair, one, <laughs> pair, one, one set of clothes. Yeah, no, nothing else. Nothing. He can wear everything he's bringing. He'll he'll just put on layers, and then once one layer gets you know Perfect. stinky, he'll just whip it off. That right. sounds great to me. <laughs> Russ, I'm sure some people are going to ask us, but what is the average cost associated with going on a trip like this? It's about fifty five hundred. Okay. And fifty five hundred covers. Uh, uh, we're gonna. This trip is going to be uh, just shy of three weeks. And that covers everything except a couple of meals. So that covers all the flights, uh, in-country and, and international flights, pretty much everything. Awesome. Uh, you know, and I, it, it might be a little more, of course, because, you know, I can't say for sure what fuel is going to do in the next year. But it, it's been steady for a while. So I suspect it'll be about that. Um, we're still pricing out what that um, boat trip is going to cost up the, up the side of Isabella. Uh, but that doesn't look too bad. Um, you know, a very large part of the trip is the uh, is getting down there and back. So once you're down there, 
the prices aren't too bad. Uh, hotels, you know, the hostels where we stay are pretty nice. The food's good. The food's fantastic, as a matter of fact. Um, nearly everybody that goes is blown away with how good the food is. It's quite a surprise. That's. I was going to ask about that. <laughs> I yeah. figured I might want to leave it alone after my joke about my own weight. But, yeah, I was going to ask about the food. Is it, you're, you're, you're eating, is it like Ecuadorian cuisine or – well, it's always fun because you know they're they're trying to cater to us, and they right. try to they often try to feed us what they think we we want because they're so tuned to you know tourists making tourists happy. You know this is their this is their lifeblood. You know they want to make us happy. So um, in the in the islands, um, you know there's uh, they raise they raise cattle on on most of the islands. They raise chickens on most of the islands. And of course, fish is readily available. So you know those those three things play a big part of every meal. Uh, rice plays a big part part of every meal. But there's lots of fresh vegetables and everything too. So um, you know, before we go, we ask everybody. You know, you know, food allergies, any spe you know, vegetarians, vegans, uh, you know, any special health concerns, and they have matched every single body, everybody's concerns 100% along the way. They have no trouble. They're so used to dealing with Americans. <laughs> you know, they know we're weird and uh, they'll, they will, they, they meet us, whatever we need. You know, if, if you uh, only eat chickens on days that start with tea, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll deal with that, you know, whatever, whatever you need, they'll, they handle it. So uh, yeah, they're fantastic. Is there a place, I mean, I see you going back to the Galapagos often. Is there a place where you haven't been that you would love to go and, and uh, maybe a species that you would love to see in the wild? I mean, I know you've been the the matter matter is there anything else? Well, on the islands, you know, the, the, the rainforest turtles are a whole other story because all we've seen in the in the in the mainlands are uh, I mean in the rainforest is uh, is uh, is podox and uh, and uh, most everything else um, I know it's there, but you know uh, we're 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 in uh, places where it would be hard you know where what we've done so far we haven't been able to see them. So, but in the in the Galapagos in the islands um, we haven't seen saddlebacks in the wild. Right, I haven't well, done that yet, and I definitely want to do that. Um, and also, uh, I would say that the the next thing on my list is what I want to do the most in the Galapagos. Is there's a a place uh, uh, on an island not far from where we normally go, but you have to do it by boat. And um, a place where there's a ocean, a deep, there's a um, an underwater vent, you know, uh, where uh, where the ocean floor is opened up a little bit. And there's gases coming up from 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 underneath, where there's uh, you know a whole bunches of species that only live at those underwater vents. Normally, those vents are really really deep, and to see those, you uh, you have to snorkel, and um, and you have to go really deep. Mm -hmm. But there's one place I'm told where there's a vent that's only 30 feet deep, and I you know I I, I snorkel all the time. I don't scuba. And so I could snorkel down to something 30 feet deep without too much trouble. So I'd like very much to go to one of those vents and see see what a vent looks like. And partly because you know there's there's a you know one of the major theories of where life originated on Earth mm. is at those vents, you know those deep water vents. And um, a chance to see one of those vents would be pretty spectacular. So I can hold my breath long enough to go down 30 feet, uh, especially with some help. And um, and uh, that's that's one of the one of the things I've always wanted to do. Um, we've seen we've been down there uh, when the sea turtles were nesting. We've seen lots and lots and lots of, of, of green sea turtles. You know they'll be there every year we go. Uh, so that part you know we've done that. We've seen uh, uh, lots of other cool herps there, but the vents and the saddlebacks are probably the top of my list still for the Galapagos. So that, but but that's the answer for the Galapagos. What about anywhere in the world? It's like, oh, anywhere in the world. <laughs> yes, that you haven't had a chance to go for. It. That was a great answer, by the way. I thought that was so cool. So don't let, let me act like I'm I'm you know uh, saying that that wasn't tremendous. That was that was awesome. But uh, I'm wondering about um, just anywhere in the world, like uh, some some of the biodiversity hotspots uh, in Southeast Asia or like. The Western Ghats or like South Africa or something like that. That's just well, um, you know, like I said before, uh, you know, I did my master's work on gopher tortoises, and I've always had a really strong love for for tortoises. You know, that's they're you know near and dear to my heart. And uh, uh, you know, now that I've done the Galapagos a number of times and I've gotten some experience taking turtle people there, and I've really enjoyed that. 
Um, I've been thinking that South Africa would make the logical next place to go. Uh, and I'd love to do a, you know, a Turtles of South Africa thing and bring a bunch of turtle people along with me uh, and um, spend a couple weeks in South Africa and, uh, you know, hit as many different species of the tortoises uh, that we can there. Of course, they, you know, they have spectacular tortoises there that would be so much fun to do. And South Africa is a great place to visit. You know, lots of other things to see there, too, while we're there. So, um, yeah, I have a number of friends who, especially those who've been with us on the Galapagos trip, that are pushing me to branch out and uh, start mm -hmm. adding some other countries to the list. And, I'm, I, you know, I've long been thinking that South Africa would be the logical next one to do. That's so, so uh, uh, now, yeah. Have you always considered yourself, this is kind of jumping around a little bit, but sure. have you always considered, do you consider yourself a, a turtle, a turtle man yourself? And, ha and ha kind of, have you always been a turtle guy or is that something that kind of, that, that a certain project brought you towards at a certain point? Because I know you've worked with other reptiles as well and other animals, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, I think that I'm probably typical for a lot of people who are interested in herps as adults and that when I was a kid, especially for males, as I was a kid, I was totally into snakes, and I and I grew up in northern Ohio, and uh, with a bunch of friends, and we went out snake collecting, um, practically every day that we could. You know, we weren't in school; we were out all the time, uh, and uh, I, you know, we caught turtles when we saw them, but we didn't, you know, didn't make much of, didn't do much with them, and I wasn't really into turtles seriously until I was an undergraduate. So you know, I was I was 18 or 19 years old. And I read Archie Carr, and I learned about sea turtles. And I was completely overwhelmed with uh, the idea that, you know, sea turtles, you know, were really important to humans as a food source, but also, you know, were such gorgeous animals in their own right. And the idea of managing a resource in a way that people could use it and yet preserve the animals. And um, I switched totally over to turtles after reading Archie Carr. And I... Uh, Went to Florida. I spent, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, I took Archie Carr's last, uh, the last class he taught before he died. Wow. Uh, and uh, I was really into it. And, uh, and then uh, I got sucked into a tortoise project. And I just had such a fantastic time that I, you know, I really changed my life over to working on turtles entirely. And um, I've done some other work. I've done quite a bit of work on lizards and a few projects on snakes. But Really, the main focus of my life for the you know for for a long time now has been turtles. Wow, that's amazing. I'm I'm floored by the fact that you that you were in Archie Carr's class. That's amazing. It was it was I'd been in communication with him for years before that. I, I actually wrote hand wrote letters to him, and he wrote hand wrote letters back to me. I mean, wow. I wish I kept them. I mean, that would have been amazing. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was a wonderful experience. He was a very wonderful guy. That's amazing. I, I, when I went to to uh, visit Dr. Pritchard in in Florida, probably the most excited he got. We're there, and he's got thirteen thousand different turtle specimens there at the Colonial Research Institute. And the most excited he got was pointing out the oil painting of of Archie Carr, absolutely which his his yeah. mentor, which is just the coolest thing ever. But um, his well, book is still important now. I still I still look at his book for things that I'm writing as well, just to kind of look at how early things were being. Um, oh, Handbook uh, of Turtles. Yep. I mean, there's my copy right there. I mean, it's <laughs> within my hand's reach. Mine too, mine <laughs> too. All the time, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a phenomenal book. Uh, and uh, yeah, Archie was a, was a warm, friendly guy that, you know, I, I credit him with the fact that we still have sea turtles in the Caribbean. You know, if it wasn't for the work he did, uh, I don't know where we would be in terms of sea turtles in much of the world, and especially in the Caribbean. Uh, you know, and and to have that to your credit, I mean, you know, who needs more? That's so cool! Wow, I I, I didn't think there was a a chance for me to have any more newfound respect for you, sir. But that ah. <laughs> that yeah. that's pretty cool. That's really cool. Wow, and I still love sea turtles. I've never done any work on them, um, but well, I, uh, uh, but I, I brought my students down, uh, a group of my students down to Costa Rica last spring to see leatherbacks, and because uh, I, you know, I wanted to see the next big turtle, you know, and uh, so we got down there just as um, females were nesting and some of the earliest nests were hatching. So we saw both nesting going on and emergence going on uh, both the same day, 
And uh, we were there for a week and, and uh, you know, leatherback turtles, you know, check that one off, you know, those, uh, that was a, a remarkable experience. Uh, but uh, I look forward to spending more time uh, with sea turtles. But in the Galapagos, we spend sometimes half a day just swimming with sea turtles. And I, I just, I just don't get enough. I mean, it's just, I could do that for days after days, just watching them feeding and hanging out and courting and stuff like that. Yeah, wow, that's so cool. Wow. Well, um, you know, the, the Galapagos, the sea turtles that you're swimming with in the Galapagos, are those a subspecies of a green turtle? Am I? Yeah. The, or is the, that just a locality? People go, yeah, people go back and forth on that. Uh, some people uh, uh, call them a, a separate species, and some people consider them, you know, the Galapagos green, and some people say it's a subspecies of, of greens. Um, I'm not sure what the latest paper on the topic is, uh, but uh, the Galapagos people are very happy to call them their own species. Uh, they they would like uh, all the Galapagos variants to be their to be their own species, and and you know maybe they are. Uh, I don't really know, but they're uh, they look just like the greens I know from Florida. That's for sure. And that's what you're swimming with when you're there, absolutely. Primarily, or, or um, uh, that's that's you know solely the only species that you're. That's you're, that's by far the most common species. We do see loggerheads mixed in with them from time to time, uh, and they do have leatherbacks too. But we uh, we've never seen leatherbacks while we're there. Um, you know they're they're still recovering from from um, from hundreds of years of of whaling and sea turtling there, and uh, so uh, that's. Uh, uh, you know, leatherbacks will be a long time coming back. Are you ever seeing when you're in the Galapagos any of the any of the um, issues caused by subsidized predators or introduced predators like goats and rats and things like that? Yeah, as a matter of fact, when we first started going to the Galapagos, Isabella still had goats, and we saw goats while we were there, and vegetation was in really bad shape. And we've been to those same places in subsequent years since the goats have been eradicated. It's night and day. I mean, it's very, very clear how it's different. And we see tortoises in places we never saw tortoises before. So there's there's no question that, you know, the different, the, the, the uh, conservation measures they've done there have had remarkable effects. That's so wonderful. Ha now have you come across hatchlings? Uh, we ne I've never seen hatchlings in the field. The, uh, the places where, uh, where they nest and where you find most hatchlings are off limits to the public. So um, we're probably not going to get into those areas uh, with with tourists. You know, as researchers, we probably could, but not with tourists. Mm -hmm. um, those areas are are you know very heavily protected, and what, of course they're worried about people coming in and lifting them. Uh, yeah. So you know that's and that's a real concern. You don't have to worry about people taking five hundred pound turtles, but you do have to worry about people taking hatchlings. Right. So I understand. That's cool. But you see all you want in the, in the, in the, in the conservation centers. They're, you know, they're easy to see them by the hundreds. Yeah. <clears throat> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, Ross, I think that's a, a good place to, you know, put a kind of put a pause button, put a pin in it. All, all right. right. Like we could have you on again and <laughs> <clears throat> tell lots of more great stories. Let's do it tomorrow. <laughs> I can actually, Hey, actually, do you mind if I ask two quick questions? Uh, I just kind of approached the YouTube people, and uh, I had two quick questions. Uh, they could be yes or no. That's fine. Uh, the first one, has any DNA been testing uh, done on Galapagos tortoises in, uh, to verify the species of them? Oh, yeah, that absolutely. You know? There's been a ton of really, really high caliber work done on the genetics of the species, uh, and it's been uh, published uh, very extensively now. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we could talk the whole next time about that. Okay. Uh, it's fantastically interesting, um, and it turns out that Gal Lonesome George is is not is not dead. Great, I heard that recently. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah and that's all due to the genetic work that these folks have been doing it's at Yale. It's tremendous work. That's so my backyard. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. What's your other question? Uh, the other question was, um, what would you recommend for someone who's looking into a profession in biology or even herpetology? Um, How about they get started, I'm assuming? Well, for one thing, vote for people who, who um, support science. Uh, because, yeah. you know, without government support, this kind of thing is really, really, really hard to do. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's a really important thing. And, I, you know, I, it, you just can't separate that from being interested in the field. you got to have people who support you. And, you know, that comes from a government that cares about science. Uh, but on top of that... Um, you know, the, the basic in biology is, you know, anything, if you want to do what I'm doing, you know, there are lots of career paths that allow you to do many, many cool things for turtles. 
But if you want to do what I'm doing, um, uh, you know, you, 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 if you do the college route, you know, you get an undergraduate degree in biology, you get a PhD in some very area of biology. There's tons of people doing really good work that you can plug in with. Uh, you know, there's lots of people who do things like what I do and um, do really cool stuff. And it's just not difficult to get hooked up with those folks. Um, got to do well in school. You know, you got to be a, you got to be good at the academic game, you know. Um, but on the other hand, this, like I said, this is only one way to do it. Um, I've got people, volunteers who've been working on our Terrapin project for um, five, six, seven, eight, nine years. They come every year and they know so much about turtles as a result of the work they've done. They've made enormous contributions to the conservation of terrapins. They are my go-to people when, I, when I'm running the project. They run the project when I'm not there. Um, there are lots of ways to make very, very meaningful contributions to the study of these guys and to the conservation of these guys without going the academic route. You know, there's tons of other ways to do this. Um, and if you don't want to do either of those, there's lots of ways to contribute with money. <laughs> you know, every conservation program needs money and uh, mm -hmm. turtles are no exception. So, you know, there's lots of ways to plug into this stuff. Um, you can do it with your, with, your, with your head. You can do it with your hands. You can do it with your wallet. Mm. Awesome. Thank you so much. Amen. Sure. My pleasure, guys. <clears throat> Thank you, Russ. And uh, so before Russ goes, we want to plug our calendar one more time. The it's new gorgeous. 2018 calendar is here and is for sale on the website. Um, so those of you who pre-ordered it, almost all of you, uh, they should be on their way to you. They were shipped out this uh, Friday and Saturday. So you should be seeing those on your doorsteps within the next couple days. And for those of you that want to get a calendar, um, we've got a few left. So get on the website, get your order in, and uh, Russ will be sending one to you again like we did right. last year. Fantastic. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, guys. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. For Russ Thank Bird, you so much. That's Anthony Pierleone, and that's Kevin Minto. I'm Steve Enders. Have a great night, folks. Take care. Good night.